Okay, well, good afternoon. This is Jay Waters. I'm with the Voices of Freedom uh, Project and the American and Wartimes Museum. Today is 10 April 20, 2021. I'm in Edinburgh, uh, Virginia, and it's my pleasure this afternoon to interview Carrie Radaba. Um, sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. If you could, just for the record, uh, tell us your, your full name and where you were born and grew up. Uh, Carrie Lee Radaba. I was born in Shalleroy, Pennsylvania. And uh, what period of uh, uh, what period did you serve in the military? Uh, I enlisted in February of '75, and I served through April of '77. Okay. And uh, you were with the Army, I understand, right, from when we were United talking States before? United States Army. United States Army. Okay, great. great. Uh, and so, uh, hold on. For, th thinking about um, your family members, you know, relatives, uncles, grandparents, did you have any, <laughs> any family members that before you had served in the military? Uh, yes. Uh, actually... Uh, according to my father's family Bible, almost every male member of my family has served in the armed forces of liege, lord, king, or country from 747 A.D. when a great ancestor of mine who was a goat herder in in the Bavarian Alps. He's out there one day tending his flock with two brothers and three cousins. And now, this is actually listed in the family Bible, uh -huh. this story, because this is how my first great ancestor earned his name. Uh, they were they were up there watching their field, their flocks, when they noticed a troop of Roman legionnaires coming up Tessel Pass. Hmm. Their village, where they live, is right on Tessel Pass. Oh wow! Yeah. These Roman legionnaires are going to go right through their village. This is not a good thing. No. So what happened? So, what they did was they set up three avalanches. One in front, one in back, and the third one right on top. Then, armed with nothing but their shepherd's crooks, they went down and beat the rest of the survivors to death. Three of them lost their lives. A third died a year less than a year later from injuries. Yeah. Wow. My great great ancestor and his younger cousin were given their name Teslavik. And from then on Yeah. Well the, the Teslavik from the from the name of the village, yeah. That's a great story. That's a, so you got a, a long history of military service in there. Um, well, so if you could, and while we're actually, let's jump to this too, since, uh, and you maybe just sit back a little bit, yeah, perfect. Um, okay. We were talking before, and a couple of the folks said that you have an, an interesting nickname that you they call you. Could you tell us what your nickname is and uh, how you got that nickname? Uh, radar. Okay. Uh, when I was in the service, I was reporting to my permanent duty station at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And when I went into the replacement depot to, to sign in, uh, the sergeant behind the desk, now I'm in dress uniform with a name tag, and I hand him my orders, and he looks at my name tag, my orders, my name tag. He he looks back and forth three or four times, 
and finally just says, fuck it, radar. So that became your name. And by the time I reached the company area, I was radar. When I walked into the company area, the, the man there at the desk, a believe it or not, uh, a warrant officer was on, on desk as, as yeah, duty officer sure. at the time, and he addressed me as radar. Private Your radar. Private radar, there you go. <laughs> and well, that's a good, that, from I think then that's, on, I think that's a good nickname. From then on, I was radar the whole time I was in the service. And, and apparently from <laughs> your uh, VFW colleagues out here, you still are. Yeah. That's, well, well, that's good, that's good. The nickname stuck. Yeah. Um, well, so thinking about September, remember September 11th, 2001, and uh, yeah. the terrorists hit the Pentagon and the New York. Wh where were you that day? And maybe just tell us what was going on in your life, what your thoughts were that day. I was getting off, getting ready to get off work. Actually, no. I was already off work. I, I was on my way home from work. And I didn't hear anything about it until I got up that afternoon. Uh, I went home and went straight to bed. And were you living out here at that point? Or yeah, yeah, okay. And what were your thoughts when you woke up that afternoon? I watched the everything that was on the air that they showed on television. I saw it time and time and time yeah, again. Yeah, and for the life of me. I do not believe that those airplanes did what they did. Those buildings were imploded and brought straight down. Mm. They didn't, they didn't, see, if you sit, watch the film, you can see where there are explosions, three yep. or four decks, three or four floors below the impact site. Right. Yeah, I've heard that that theory. Yeah. Okay. But so you thought where those that, buildings hit, yeah. where those airplanes hit, those buildings should have never collapsed all the way to the ground. Yeah. So you thought that initially, or it took you some time to come to It didn't to this? take me no time at yeah. all. Okay. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but I know enough about engineering to know that those buildings at the top floor sway 120 feet, mm -hmm. depending upon the breeze, the direction the breeze is going. Yeah. Okay. Not... Nothing fell out of the shadow of that building, either of them. Mm -hmm. No debris from the buildings went beyond yeah, the shadow. It just went straight down. It went straight down on itself. Yep. This does not happen unless the building is rigged. Well, then what about the plane that hit the Pentagon? Well, first off, it came in on an angle and went in wing first and slid into the into the building. Okay. Now, theory. I am a terrorist. I want to cause as much murder, mayhem, and dis and inflict as much terror as possible. When do I strike? Not that early in the morning. Mm -hmm. I strike later, closer to noon hour, when the building is at its fullest. More bang for the buck. Yeah, so to speak. These buildings 
were at less than 30% occupancy when the plane struck. If they wait four hours, they get the whole build, yeah. building's full. Close to 90% occupancy. Where's the terror? Yep. Now right. you see the magnitude of what they're try, trying to blame on foreign terrorists. That was strictly by domestic. Okay. Well, and I'm not saying who that domestic terrorist was. Right. But it did not, it was not, it was highly placed. Okay. Well, let's, let's go back and talk about your time in the military. So, um, we know you were in the Army. So, what, what made you join the, the military and specifically why did you join the Army? Uh, family tradition for the biggest part. Absolutely. Yeah. Long, uh, long family tradition. And there were not any real prospects at that time in the civilian world that I thought I couldn't get an education and some on hands yeah. training in the, in the military. Were you, were you still up in Pennsylvania at this point? Yes. Yeah. And so was it like right after high school that you went in? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, well, so what was it like going to the recruiting station in 1975, 75? Uh, well, I was getting ready to graduate in May, so I went in in February to enlist. And so that I could go right in right after I graduated from high school. Yeah. Well, so you're about 17, 18 years old? 18. Yeah. Uh, okay. And... Uh, I was getting, you know, what else was there to do? So yeah. I, I just went in, went into Pittsburgh and signed up and was sworn in. And they said, "See you, July 1st. Yeah. Okay. Well, and so what, uh, what specialty did you select? Aircraft electrician. Okay. So now you've you've graduated. High school, it's July. Um, where did you go for basic training? Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay, tell us about Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, I had to <laughs> police up the company area one time because I was seen throwing a cigarette butt on the ground. Ah. Uh, Believe me, I was not the only person to throw a cigarette butt on the ground. But I just happened to be seen. Yeah. Uh, and that evening at formation, I was singled out by the drill sergeant who informed me that after evening formation was dismissed, I was to meet him at the foot of the barracks and collect my tools. Uh, my tools were very simple. A five gallon coffee can minus the top and a pair of knee pads. Okay. <coughs> For the next hour and a half on my hands and knees, I policed the company area. When I had a full can, the sergeant said I was done. Wow. With that stage. Yeah. Now, then came part two. I put the lid on the can, and he said, now we're going to dispose of this properly. He marched me half a mile out into the booties and with an entrenching tool, I proceeded to dig a hole six feet deep. Wow. How long did that take you? This took me until close to 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. Uh, 
the drill sergeant had a lantern that he had on a pole set up at the top so I could see what, so he and I could see what yeah. we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, when he said the hole was deep enough, I stopped digging. He gave me a hand pulling myself out. And then he handed me the can, put that in there. And then I proceeded to fill the hole back in. <laughs> this took another two hours. Yeah. It was midnight by the time I got back to the company area and back to bed. And you had to get up the next morning and do it all over At again. At 4.30. Yeah, for <laughs> PT and everything else. Well, but so it sounds like despite that, you, you survived basic training. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you probably never... Even to this day, I still don't throw my cigarette butts down on the ground. Yeah, I was going to ask whether you threw them or you just made sure you, you weren't seen. Oh, no. I I field strip my cigarettes, and if I don't have my wagon or, or an ashtray or something with me, they go into my pocket. That's good. And when I get where I'm going, then I empty it. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, so you completed basic training, and then I'm looking... Um, you looks like you went for some specialized training. Where, where, where'd you go next and what did you do uh, there? Fort Eustis, Virginia, where I learned how to become an aircraft electrician, mostly with helicopters, but we uh, worked on all kinds of aircraft. All you have to do is have the wiring diagrams and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, so but so how was the training? Did you did you uh, feel like it was? Um, it was good. It was good. Yeah, you, you learned and yeah, I learned plenty. Uh, was that a little bit more relaxed than uh, basic training, or was it still pretty tight schedules? And it was a lot more relaxed. Uh, and it was cold too. Okay. Because uh, it was... Probably, what, winter time? January by the time I yeah. finished boot camp. 1976, probably, yeah. You know. Yeah. Okay. And Fort Eustis is not a nice place to be in the middle of winter. Yeah, I can believe it. You got that cold air coming in off the ocean up in yeah. Chesapeake. Yeah. It is not nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, any other... Incidents, positive or negative, uh, at Fort Eustis? I got a letter of commendation by volunteering to help with the officer's mess during a change of command ceremony okay. yeah. at Fort, Dick, Fort Eustis at that time. Uh... So, I mean, other than that, okay. basically I was a bus boy. <laughs> yeah, but, but you volunteered, and yeah. I think the leader, I volunteered. They, they, the Army likes that. They always tell you not to volunteer, but sometimes it pays off. Yeah, well. And then, uh, so you've now completed your training, and it, um, you went to your first assignment. Where was that? In, Fort uh, Dix, New Jersey. Um, I mean, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Yeah, Kent okay, Fort Campbell, yep. So now you're at Fort Campbell. Uh, and what's your rank by now? Have you, have you been promoted uh, E two. E two. So you moved up from E one to E two, and yeah, but but still kind of in your early phase. What, so how was Fort Campbell? And uh, uh, tell us your unit. Kind of what was that experience? I was in a discom company on an airborne base. We did five miles a day before breakfast. Mm -hmm. We were out on the airfield. We were not an infantry company or anything else. Yep. We didn't even wear the puking buzzard or a screaming chicken, whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, puking buzzard. <laughs> uh, it went by both of those names quite frequently and sometimes even worse. <laughs> but... Uh, I was stationed out at Campbell Army Airfield, which for all intents and purposes was actually an Air Force operated base. Yeah. Uh, we did DS repair 
on all aircraft for the 101st. If it flew, we fixed it. And again, being a air assault unit, again, a lot of helicopters, but they yes. did have some fixed wing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I did get to work on one C-5A while I was there. Okay. Uh, I had to change the anti-collision light on the top of the tail boom. Wow. <laughs> the access panel in which you stood on to, to work on this was about 18 inches wide and about two feet long, three feet long. Hmm. And you dropped it out, you climbed on it, hooked yourself on, and then you're standing up there and you're about this much of your body is above, above the top of the tail boom. Mm. You've got your toolbox down here where you can get to it. And believe me, you take the whole tail light, the collision light assembly with you. You don't do any repairs on it while it's up there. You just go up there, you disconnect the one that's there, and take the new one out, put it in place, and then you take it back to the shop and do whatever you okay. got to do. Yeah. How and how long would that take you? Uh, it might be anything for from changing a light bulb to changing the motor. Okay. Uh, so it could be pretty quick, or it could take yeah. a while. Yeah. Okay. Well, how did you like Fort Campbell overall? Uh, It was, it had its good points, but it also had its bad points. Yeah. Well, and, and for anybody that's listening to the interview, Fort Campbell's on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. And, yeah. Uh, and this was 1976 into 77, right? Uh, two of the counties, now, Fort Campbell straddles four separate counties in two separate states. Right. Two counties are dry. No alcohol, yeah. period. Uh, now, the other two counties, the other two counties, have different legal drinking age. One is twenty-one, the other is eighteen. Yeah. The post allowed 18 because you were in the service, okay? So if we went to the PX or we could get sure. yeah. liquor or yeah. whatever yeah. to drink. In my case, it was never beer. I have an extreme allergy to hops. I learned this very young. So I stayed away from beer. Well, what did you guys do when you had some free time down there? Uh, I went to the last public performance of the Grand Ole Opry. Okay. Before they moved out of Ryman Auditorium. And that's when they moved to, Dal to uh, Opryland. Mm-hmm. And then they moved back to Ryman Auditorium, but that was many years later. Okay. And I was long gone from there. But when I, yeah. Um, I did get to see the last public performance at the Ryman Auditorium. Cool. Which was nice. And I think as you as you came into the military, the the Vietnam War was just about over. Um, oh. Was there any discussion of you having to ship out anywhere else, or? Uh, I did have. I was actually given an opportunity to go to Germany on Reforger 76. Yeah. But at the last minute, we got a new new personnel in my company. And after going through all of the shots and all of the paperwork to go overseas, I got booted at the last minute. As consolation prize, now, worse yet, Reforger 76 
would have been taking place on part of my family's estates in Germany. There you go. I would have had a free trip home <laughs> to visit family whom I had never even met. Yeah. Both of my grandfathers served in the German army during the First World War. They both came here after the war, okay. and all of their, well, my my paternal grandfather's, seven of his nine, nine sons served in World War II. Three served in Korea, and one served in Korea and Vietnam. Uh... My maternal grandfather only had one one child, a daughter, so that enough said there. Uh, okay. My father was the third son of nine. Excellent. Nine boys, six girls, 13 of them reached maturity. Majority. Yeah. Uh, not bad. Do you still have any relatives in Germany now? Uh, my great uncle was in Germany and living there up until well after World War II. As far as his side of the family goes, I have no idea. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I know that the family is there. There's castle, there's huge estates, but how much family is there, I do not know. Okay. Well, so then, um, as your time in the Army was, was winding down, um, did you choose to separate? Were you offered re-enlistment opportunities? Kind uh, of what? What happened towards Actually, the end? Actually, I was offered an early discharge. Okay. Uh, I had a slight disagreement with a warrant officer on the flight line. Uh, this resulted in my being offered an early out. Officially, they cannot persecute whistleblowers, but I found that I was never going to get promoted, and the military does not offer reenlistments to E twos. Right. They do not want Beetle Baileys. Yeah. So, my military career was at an end. It was a peacetime army, and that incident with the warrant officer on the flight line soured my taste in the military to yeah. the fullest. Well, and, and post-Vietnam, the Army was drawing down anyway, so yeah. they, they were probably looking for opportunities to have people leave so, early. Okay. But so, what did you do? You, did you come to, to Virginia then? or? Uh, I came back up to Pennsylvania. Uh, went kicked around a little bit, went to school here, there, and a couple other places. Uh, unfortunately, my training in the military, although helpful, was not enough to get me an A&P license. And what's an A&P license? Airframe and power plant. Okay. To work on air, airplanes in the civilian world. You have to have dual rating. I had the power plant and I could learn to airframe but my mechanical skills were virtually non-existent. This improved out through my military career. I was not, I was one of those people that's lucky that they know lefty loosey righty tighty <laughs> and then when it comes to metrics the it's a whole different ball game there. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, how did you end up in Virginia? Since you're since we're in Virginia, uh, I'd just like to know how you got here. In November of '85, a hurricane came up the Ohio Valley and literally died, stalled out right on top of the mountain there outside of Martinsburg, West Virginia. For 15 days, it rained almost nonstop. Uh, the hurricane wound its way down to a tropical depression and then just, yeah, it just petered itself out, but it just got stuck there yep. and drenched the entire area with floodwaters. The river crested at Pittsburgh at a all-time record 37 feet and change. The flood, the subways were flooded. Something that had never yeah. happened before. Yeah. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law had a gas station convenience store uh, in a little place called Fayette City. I was working there at the time, but needless to say, the flood ended the business. Yeah. There was 18 inches of the crown of the roof that showed the water line. Yeah, wow. That's a lot <laughs> where of water. Where the river got flooded, yeah. where yeah. the river crested. Wow. <laughs> well, how long have you been down here now? Uh, that was in November of 85 when I came down here. Actually, I came down here quite by accident. I was going to visit a friend in New Jersey who worked for AT&T. I was hitchhiking, which is my main mode of transportation because I do not like to drive. Yeah. And I got as far as Breezewood and a gentleman from Fort Valley picked me up. <laughs> he drove me all the way to New Jersey and then back down to Virginia. Wow. Back up to Pennsylvania where I got my where I was able to collect my belongings and moved back down here to Virginia in Fort Valley. Okay. Uh got a job, got a place to live, all by accident. Yeah. All by by standing out at the side of the road with my thumb out. Yeah. It was, the gentleman had just lost a co-worker who drove off the Edinburgh Mountain. Wow. Going up to Tower Road. Yeah. He went off the, the side of the mountain and died. Yeah. Uh, he was just on his way rambling around for a while while this settled down and everything. Uh, and... He got me a job working with him, uh, doing roofs, roofing and yeah, such, yeah. Uh, which, I mean, what, what did I need to do now? I got a job, I got a roof over my head, a place to stay, I mean, yeah, and I got... was all, and it, all set up, Yeah, and I hadn't even been to Virginia since... 75. Yeah, for, for, <laughs> for a decade. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. And then and you're still here. Yeah. Well, so how do you think, for, for better or for worse, we ask all our veterans this, how do you think the military uh, affected your the rest of your life? Uh, except for the incident with the warrant officer that brought my career to an end, overall, I, I would say I was very satisfied with it. I mean, yeah. I learned a lot in that two years that I'd have never learned right. in the civilian world. If it were up to me, I'd make military service or civil service mandatory upon graduation from, from high school and or college. Right. Yeah, that's what we were talking about before. So you, you, you certainly but, did, did your part. You know, some people stay no. for... 
20 as or 30 far as years, making, but yeah, yeah. As far as making a career out of it, yeah. I had an uncle that spent 30 years in the Army, fought in two wars, and retired a command sergeant major from Redstone Missile Base in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I mean. But you did your part. You did two did years. Some people do 20, I, but you I did, did my two. Service. You did your time. I served my country yeah. to the yeah. best of my Absolutely. abilities. Absolutely. And. Uh, well, related to that, what would you want, um, if, you know, if kids or grandkids are just like 50 or 100 years from now, we're, we're gone from this planet. But what would you want people to know about you and, and your, your commitment to service? Well, barring its massive faults and weaknesses this is the best government that we got right now and I'm it is far from being perfect and it's a mismatch of people who have different and cross purposes Officially, they're supposed to be working for the betterment of the people that they govern. Unofficially, though, the people in office do not perform anywhere near what they're, they're supposed to. Okay. They forget that the ideals that they are there to protect are there for a reason to protect mm -hmm. and to serve self-service does not come into that and too many of your politicians are crooked and are in the game just to line their pockets yep that, that's for sure well mr radar or carry radar we, we've covered a lot of ground some interesting family history, your your personal story is, is interesting, uh, and you did do your service. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to cover that we hadn't already discussed? 